Hey, we are back. Second episode of the day. Super excited today to dialogue about Lutheran soteriology. Yes. We've got Dr. Joel Bierman on the other line. And, and I believe this is correct. I believe this is correct. The first time I heard about Dr. Bierman was from Flame, the Christian rapper who went Lutheran. Oh, yeah. Uh, he actually drops his name. You love Flame. Direct, I, I do actually listen to him quite a bit. Yeah. I, his album, his newest album was... He fires you up. Ah, <laughs> that was bad. Yeah, sorry. Guys, Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. If you're new to the channel, we dialogue about theology with different pastors and teachers from different churches and denominations. Uh, our ultimate goal is to challenge our presuppositions when we come to a text. Yeah, because of our denominational affiliations or our upbringing and a history, uh, we often have an interpretation of the text. We, we just kind of assume and pre-read into the text. Uh, but we found that inviting different pastors and teachers from churches and denominations help us challenge our presuppositions position so that we can better understand God's word and ultimately help us better understand the God who's given us his word. With me in studio is Michael. Michael, tell us about some of the shows before we introduce uh, Dr. Bierman and, and our subject today. Tell us about some of the stuff that has been coming down the pipe and stuff we have looking to look forward to in, uh, in the next couple weeks. Absolutely. Well, uh, so last week we had Frederica Matthews Green uh -huh. uh, for part part two yeah. of um, talking about Eastern Orthodoxy versus Protestantism. What, how are they different? How are they similar? And so talk to that. It was a really great conversation. And then we also had N.T. Wright. Mm -hmm. And man, uh, that was just a Some rich... Some still said he was wrong. <laughs> Pretty sure he's right. <laughs> Others were looking for O.T. Wright. That's but right. We, we, we had <laughs> N.T. Wright and uh, talked through new heavens and new earth, just the renewal of all things and all the implications that that has for the Christian's li Christian life. Great conversation. Uh, and then just the hour before this, a lot of you in the chat were, were just watching it, but uh, Josh and I had a conversation about the Imago Dei, the image of God, and the implications that that has uh, for us and just what our culture is going through, what America and the world is going through right now. So uh, anyway, so check that out. It's uh, We just did that. But we're excited about the episode today with Dr. Bierman. Dr. Bierman, so excited to have you. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, and are you writing any books, or uh, just what do you do? How can people connect with you? Yeah, I teach at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. It's a denominational seminary of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. I've taught there about 18 years now. And before that, I was a parish pastor for 11 years in the Missouri Synod. Uh, I've written a couple of books. I'm really interested in ethics, Christian ethics, uh, Christian living. Uh, I've also been very interested in interaction of church, state, and left-hand, right-hand realm sort of stuff. Traditionally, what we call two kingdoms, even though I don't own that term very much. And interested very much now also in the whole area of vocation and work and how that interacts with Sabbath, um, Joseph Pieper and leisure, these kinds of things. So I'm very interested in a lot of that sort of thing, aesthetics and the Imago Dei, very keen. I'm keen on that as well. I've done I taught some stuff on man and woman in Christ and the image of God comes up all the time. And I would love to talk to you guys about that one, too. But we'll wow. do some theriology if you can, want. To. That's cool. Can can we just have like a five-hour show and we cover <laughs> yeah, we'll all of those things? Any of, the, any of those things are <laughs> fascinating to us. And when having you on, like we were dialoguing back and forth in an email and trying to figure out what are we going to talk about because there's so much Lutheran ground that I really want to cover and I'm excited to have you on the show. Yes. Uh, the, the book that has changed my life more than the like any other book outside of the Bible was a biography on Metaxas, uh, uh, on, <laughs> on, not on by. Metaxas, by Metaxas on Luther. So uh, Lutheran theology has uh, really impacted my life and the, the life and study of Martin Luther has really impacted my life. So I'm glad we get to talk about soteriology because this is something that's kind of a hot button issue for, for the West and Protestantism in general. We love dialoguing about soteriology. Yes. Uh, so, so this will kind of like be right in line with our audience. Uh, so, so cool. give us kind of an, what well, maybe, and, maybe and just broad. real quickly for those, uh, for anyone who doesn't know soteriology, it's, it's right. basically things pertaining to salvation. Yeah. 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 The study of salvation, uh, as it, is seen in scripture. So, so, so you, your, your view of Lutheran soteriology, I'd love to, if you're, if you're interested in it, just kind of go through what would be the typical, what would be five points of Calvinism and kind of use those as our outline, uh, as the Armenians would say, Hey, these are our five points of Armenianism and just kind of dialogue. What, what is the Lutheran, uh, uh, uh denomination, I was going to say faith, like you guys are different faith, uh, <laughs> the Lutheran denomination holds you on things like total depravity, yeah. limited atonement, irresistible grace, so forth and so on. So so let's start with total depravity, something that most of us all agree on. Uh, how, how would the Lutheran position articulate, how would you articulate yeah. uh, the position of total depravity? 
Well, I'll, I'll give you an overview to start. So you're right, yeah, soteriology just is coming straight from the Greek root soter, meaning savior. And so that's what we, we're dealing with here is the whole idea of salvation. And yes, the classic five-point tulip Calvinism, which Flame kind of repudiates, um, by the way. <coughs> um, the, the, exactly right, total depravity we'd, we'd agree on. And where, where we would come down is we would say, man has completely fallen, he has lost the image of God in the sense of the, the original righteousness. Now, are there latent things? Sure, those that linger on. But the idea is that man is completely incapable of reaching God, accessing God, even choosing God, cannot do it. So the total depravity makes him completely fallen sinner, and the, the bound will, we're spot on. You know, Luther's de servio arbitrio, the, the bound will, yeah, that's it. And um, I, I, I will own that one, absolutely. There is absolute bound will, and so the total depravity makes him completely unable to choose God, lean towards God, desire God in any way. Okay. Great. Can, can I jump on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... Uh, and how would you how would you understand say judicial hardening and uh, maybe speaking specifically of for instance when Jesus tells parables and uh, and and he says well this is so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not hear what would you say uh, Dr. Bierman to somebody who who responds to you and says well why would uh, why would Jesus even need to do that why would why would anyone need to be judicially hardened if they're already naturally hardened in their sin? How would a Lutheran respond to that question? Yeah, I'm not sure that the see the judicially hardened. I'm not sure if I would even label that as something he's actively doing to them as okay. much as he's just expressing the fact that these guys are hard. They can't see. It's like um, Jeremiah being sent to the people of Israel. They're not going to listen. They're not going to respond. Their hearts are hard. <clears throat> It's just how they are. And so, we're, yeah, so I would say that it's not like they have to be singled out. Now, does God harden Pharaoh's heart? Yeah, we're told that straight up. And why? Because that's what God wants to do. And that's what's going on there. And to try to sort out why Pharaoh, you know, that's kind of thing. But I, I, I would say the judicial hardening, I'm not familiar with that terminology, frankly. And I would just yeah. point to we're all depraved. No, no chance until God takes initiative to, to make us be able to hear. Yeah. Okay. So, like, I think judicial hardening would be uh, typically the the what Romans chapter one, you know, that they sure. they chose not to honor God and worship the created thing rather than the creator. So God gave them over. That's and right. They gave them over, over and over and over again. Yeah. God allows their depravity to be enriched and deepened in such a way that they become depraved. Right. Uh, so so uh, the judicial hardening that I think you're speaking to is that Jesus is saying, hey, uh, uh, I, I'm trying to hide and conceal what I'm saying so that their hearts will in fact be hardened. Uh does that, that that lines up kind sure. of explain Judas right. Hardening? Sure. But yeah, and the same with Pharaoh. But but taking Pharaoh for an example, God had a very specific purpose in that case. He wanted to make his power known through the plagues mm -hmm. and and uh, or whether it be the Jewish leaders or whoever else, there there tends to be kind of an explanation. like you quoted Romans chapter one, there's an explanation. They were already hardened in their sin and God hardened them, uh, hardened them more. So that that is what I was talking about. What was already the, there. It was it's sort of like a, a part of the intensification of the judgment. Right? Yeah, right. like this, this is God passing judgment on man's willful disobedience, and yeah, the the, the and it becomes exponential. Correct, no yeah. problem there. And is God free to do that? Of course, God is free to do what He wants. And is God just? Of course, uh, man is rejecting God, which He's prone to do. And this gets us into the what will become a ultimately the, the crux of this whole thing. But we'll get we'll save that. We're, we're getting. Yeah. There. Reminds me of this quote from John Owen. He says, the most terrifying judgment of God in the world is the hardening of the human heart. Ah. Hey. So. Quoting a Puritan this early. That's, <laughs> it's going to be a good show. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, we're, 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 we're talking about uh, the total depravity. The next one, uh, uh, total depravity. How, how do we, uh, like unconditional, unconditional election. election. How, does how do you the, spell tulip, Josh? Yeah, I know. I was working on it. <laughs> Lutherans. How do Lutherans understand unconditional election? Unconditional election... We, yeah, we would say God makes the choice, and that we would com we have complete ownership of divine monergism. God alone does the work. He does the electing. It's his call. He chooses, and he chooses from before time began, and his choice has 
absolutely nothing to do with us, with anything in us. Man is fallen and there's no difference. It's not like I like him because he's nice. I don't like him because he's not nice. No, lost is lost, fallen is fallen. So God makes his choice and that's it. Now, the idea that it's, um, well, yes, probably enough on the unconditional election. Yes. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll how, for the, how, is, a, how is that distinguished from the reformed view of unconditional election? I'll call. I'll I'll take a pass on that one because I'm not even sure if I would know what the reform view would be specifically. Sure, sure. Okay. No. Well, it sounds exactly like the reform position to me. No. Yeah. Uh, for sure. So, so I, I think it's. I think it probably is compatible. Frankly, I okay. don't have any problem with that. And, and from what I understand, there seems to be a lot of commonality on many of the points leading up to things like irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. From what I understand, there's a bit of disagreement uh, on, on the Lutheran side and, and the, uh, the Calvinistic side. So, so maybe help us understand. So we, we're kind of moving, we're tiptoeing through the, the tulip quite quickly here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T and U, we've got a uh, lot of the, the uniformity. T and the U, a lot of uniformity. Those are easy. Okay, uh, so so limited atonement. This is one that I know that you guys disagree on. So yeah. so help me understand the view of limited atonement. If God sh- selects only a couple or an, uh, uh, maybe even a couple, many to be saved, but doesn't select others, how does atonement work into that? It's one of these things where, and this is where we start running into the the a big distinction between a Lutheran understanding of these things and and a more Calvinistic understanding, and it goes down to the. the this is going to be unsatisfying, but the reality is we don't want, we don't need to make sense. We're not trying to make it make sense. We're simply trying to confess what's there. And what we would say is the atonement is for all and that Christ died once for all the new man for the, for the old man and all have been saved. And so the, I would argue that with the crucifixion and resurrection, the entire world is redeemed. The atonement is there for all. And then some, willfully refuse. And you say, well, they're all refusing because they're all lost until God's grace comes. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. But that's kind of not what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about is for whom did Christ die? And he died for all. So you're telling me he died for people that he knew were going to go to hell. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. But that's what he did because he chose to save all. And he came for the entire world to seek and save that which is lost. It's all lost. He's saving it all. He's offering it all. But the world willfully, stubbornly rejects and refuses. So you have individuals who are still refusing to be part of it, but that's their willful choice because of their lostness. And you say, they have no choice, right? Because they have a bound will. And that's quite, quite right. But the limited atonement, we would say, no, not at all. The scripture is quite clear. There's nothing there that says he died only for the elect, only for those who chose him. That's not there. He dies for the world. He dies for all the creation. Okay. And What would you say to a Calvinist person who might respond and say, well, but logically this this means that sins are being double paid because Christ is paying for the sins of the world on the cross, and then that person's paying for it all over again in hell because they didn't receive what was offered. So how would you respond to that? I'd, I'd say my response would be, I think you're looking at it the wrong way. You're looking at it a transactional thing, and it's not it's not the point of paying off the sins of the transaction. It's as much as grace is being accomplished at the cross. And what's happened, yeah, are the sins of the world paid for? Sure. But what's going on here is, is this superabundant grace. God is showing his His heart. He's, he's showing his love. He's, he's bringing the creation back to himself. And the whole creation is back. He gets it all. But some, stupidly, willfully, refuse. Some simply Mm -hmm. reject. And there's no accounting for this. Why would you do this? But you do. And Luther's famous illustration of, so a man buys you a castle and gives it to you, and it's yours. You simply refuse to move in. Well, whose fault is that? Is it the one who gave you the castle or you're the idiot who refuses to move in? Is it, it's really your castle, but you refuse to live there. You refuse to take the benefit of it. It's your own stupidity, even though it's your gift. And that's exactly how we would look at the atonement. The atonement is there for all. It's done. If they refuse and they end up going to hell because of the refusal and they pay for their sins, it's their foolish choice that's brought that on themselves. Okay. So, so uh, in, in talking about the this is this is where the conversation of monergism and irresistible grace comes into place so we have this atonement that is a universal atonement uh and in the same way that that calvinist would say 
uh, he only dies for a select few uh, because his blood isn't being shed for all. That seems to be a worldview system that's kind of eisegeted into the text. If, if you were to ask me, because I'm, I'm not just kind of, you don't, you're not familiar with us. <laughs> we, are, we are washy soteriologists here. Uh, I, I hold to some very strong Calvinistic positions as far as like total depravity. I'm all about that total depravity. Uh, but when, you're, when you start asking about like, unconditional election, you start talking about irresistible grace, I get kind of wishy on some of that stuff because I just don't see them in the text. Though they're very logical from other things that we see in the text, I think that they kind of, like you said, with limited atonement, seems to fly in the face of he died for everyone. Exactly. You know, especially those who believe. Well, so, but you don't believe unconditional election is in any texts? So I guess the way that I would, I would hold to kind of an unconditional, or the way that I would look at election, I wouldn't, title it, first of all, Unconditional Election. Um, I would look at election as uh, the work of God choosing people for a work or task, um, yeah. probably. Um, so, okay. we, we would use Let's the look. phrase e- eternal election rather than unconditional. Eternal election, that God has chosen me from before time began based on nothing in me. And so the, yeah. the term unconditional is not one we would use at all. We would use eternal election, though, certainly. Okay. Gotcha. And what uh, are, are there any like passages in Scripture that are like kind of your go-to election passages? Probably just the Ephesians chapter one is the biggest um, to yeah. me. You know, before creation, He knew you, and He chose you. Absolutely, chose you before the foundation of the world. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, good. Okay, so you were you were venturing into the I of yeah. tulip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so tell us about irresistible grace. I'm actually really interested in in getting some clarity here on the the nature of grace. Because I'm not even going to call it yeah. irresistible grace. That's what the Calvinists call it. But but how do the, the the Lutheran denominations view this doctrine of grace? This is a great question, and and Lutherans don't even all agree on all this kind of thing. Because you've got sure. radical Lutherans like Gerhard Ferdy, who you talked about Jordan Cooper. He, he and I are on the same wavelength, wavelength on this. So what you heard from him, I will echo mostly. But <laughs> grace, grace, I would argue, I would say has in essentially two components. The one we think about most would be the idea of the favor donum, um, the, the gift of God, the God's, the, the, the just his the favor day he probed to Christum, the favor of God on a account of Christ. He just simply chooses me in Christ, and it's it's uh, coming to me without anything in my merit at all, and it's just gift, and I'm now his. And so why do I get that? I don't. And the um, infant baptism, we'll throw that one in the mix, it just captures it beautifully, because here you have an infant who could care less about anything except next meal, clean diaper, well, I want to go to sleep. And this infant is claimed by God and said, you now belong to me. What did the child have to do with it? Nothing. Nothing. That's grace. That's, that's pure, unadulterated grace. God just reaches down, grabs the kid and says, you're mine now. And the kid says, okay. And he simply receives. And even his okay is a gift of the Holy Spirit. This is exactly what we'd argue. Even his ability to say okay is something that God works in him that he receives. Now I've got this gift. <sighs> And that's grace. Now what this grace does is it works in me. And now we talk about kind of sometimes grace as not just the favor, but the donum, the, the, the action. Now I'm able to live this new life. I, I have the ability to do right things. God's grace empowers me. Scripture certainly talks that way. So the main thing, though, when we're talking about soteriology, the idea of grace is that God simply makes his call. And this is divine monergism in spades. God chooses God gives the Holy Spirit. God gives the ability even to believe. And so this is how we would read Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you're saved through faith, and even this is not your, your own. It is the gift of God. So God is giving this gift. Even the gift to believe comes from him. Now, I do the believing, but the Holy Spirit has to animate me. And as Melanchthon talks about it, he's not converting blocks of wood or chunks of stone. He's converting living beings who have emotions and thoughts. But God uses those things so that we decide to follow him, but it's all the work of the Holy Spirit, complete divine monergism. So, so with, uh, you know, we've got groups here, uh, uh, Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Pentecostals, Charismatics, the whole nine, they hear you talking about infant baptism. They're talking about hearing you talk about uh, the grace of God that is, that is selecting these individuals. Doesn't it seem as if the, uh, the grace of salvation, if infant baptism is a thing, that's actually the selection of the parents and not the selection of God? Like how, how does God, how do we know that God has selected these infants in the same way that you would say, hey, I see, uh, um, 
uh, atonement, uh, limited atonement, read into a Calvinist interpretation, uh, the, the Baptists, Pentecostals, and Charismatics say, well, we think that you're reading infant baptism into a text, whereas we don't see it necessarily in the text. How would you respond to that? Well, I would say baptism now saves you, and which is pretty clear cut. This is what baptism is doing. It's doing the saving. And see, it gets down to the whole premise of what is faith anyway. If you look at faith as this gift that has to be given because I'm a, I'm a dead in my sin. And this, this is kind of the basic premise. When I try to explain infant baptism, I start not by talking about babies, mother, they can believe. I start with the whole premise of what is the state of the sinner apart from Christ? He is spiritually blind, spiritually deaf, spiritually dead. Spiritually dead people don't decide anything. Dead people don't make choices. Dead people have to be made alive. They have to be animated. God has to make alive what is dead. And God does that through the power of the word proclaimed. And the word proclaimed through the sacrament. So the sacrament becomes the means of God doing the proclaiming. And who's getting elected? I go out as, and this is one of the Ferdy's phrases, and I will agree with this one. Gerhard Ferdy was a guy generation before me. And he would talk about, you go out and you, you do the electing. And so in other words, I look at the dude and I say, God has chosen you. You have been called, he is, he is giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit. What are you gonna do with that? And when he says, cool. Yeah, great. And when he says, no, what are you talking about? I have nothing to do with this. I, I, my read on that would be he is rejecting the gift given. And so he is refusing. So that's where, no, it's not an irresistible grace. You can you can reject it. And here's where the big dilemma comes. So I believe absolutely in divine monergism. And I believe absolutely in human responsibility, human accountability. A man can refuse. A man can look at God and say, to heck with it. I don't want what you give. And you say, God gives whatever he wants. He does, but he also gives man this ability, or man has this ability to jump ship and, and, and thwart God's purpose, which sounds insane, and yet that's exactly what we see in Scripture. And this is the guts of the Lutheran position, because we're not Calvinist and we're not Arminian. And we're right. not a and we're not a homogenous trying to you know keep them all both happy. We're just saying here's what the text gives us. What the text gives you is complete divine monergism. What the text gives you is complete whole, whole human accountability. You are accountable for the choice you make, but you can only say no. Is that fair? I don't care. It's the way it is. And so God gives the grace. When I have grace, all I can say is praise God, He saved me. When I reject God's gift, all I can say is it's my own damn fault that I'm going. I'm cursed. I am damned because of my own willful rejection of God. Yeah. And then uh, I've got another question for you, just following sure. up on the tail end of that. Uh, so so if if regeneration, uh, salvation and regeneration, I, I think in, in, in terms that would be more precise for to use the word regeneration instead of yeah. salvation, because it's so it's such a salvation can be so broad. Right. Sure. So in the moment of regeneration, you've been made alive. Would you say? In, in the, the example that you gave, baptism, uh, you are doing the electing by by immersing this person in water that makes them regenerate. In yeah. preaching the gospel, they are hearing uh, uh, with with unmerited favor, they are getting the power of God into salvation for everyone who believes. Are you saying that the moment they hear the gospel, they are in fact regenerate, and then they are rejecting that regeneration? Uh, but before I get you to answer that question, we're going to do a quick word from our sponsors. Hey guys, the song you're listening to right now is from Stonebridge Worship. Now, Stonebridge is sponsoring this episode of Remnant Radio, and last week they sent us a Dropbox link to this full album. And I'm telling you, this album is awesome. It's edifying. The quality is spot on. And if you haven't checked out Stonebridge Worship, just go over to your Spotify channel and type in Worthy Is Jesus. That's the song you're listening to right now. Uh, the song is amazing. Uh, and, if, and if you don't have Spotify, man, go check out their YouTube video link. I put it in the description of this video at the bottom. You can watch the full music video that you're watching right now. And another, man, big thank you to Stonebridge Worship in sponsoring this episode of Remnant Radio. Video. 
Sorry, I'm switching tonight and doing the ads here. So, so just picking right back out where we left off, Dr. Bierman, you, you'd said that like in water baptism, for instance, it seems as if the, that the time that the child is immersed in water, that they become regenerate. And then you also said that when you're going out and you're doing the evangelism, you're actually doing the electing on behalf of God, right? Right. You've received the gospel. Are they becoming regenerate at the moment that you proclaim the gospel and then <laughs> apostatizing from that gospel if they reject it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to look at it, a great way to ask it. And I don't know if I can enter into the human psyche or to know exactly where they stand or what's going on in that moment that the Holy Spirit is entering in and convicting a person in his heart. And I believe this happens. You know, you know, it sounds a little mystical and stuff, but I think this is kind of how it, how, how it goes. So the Holy Spirit works through the word proclaimed. The word is being proclaimed. The guy's hearing the story of Christ, the narrative of salvation, and he's hearing all this and he's thinking, yeah, I've heard this before. And yeah, this is a bunch of junk. So has God worked, you know, is he knocking on the door? Yeah, I think he is actually what he's doing. It's the whole revelation thing. I'm standing at the door and knock. Yeah, yes. Bang, bang, bang. Hey, I'm here. And so the guy needs to open the door and let him in. Well, he can only open the door if the Holy Spirit comes around and pulls it open for him. And yet he can resist that. So I, I don't get this. I'll this, never be able to explain it because it's really inexplicable how you can hold on to both things at once. But that's simply what I do. Now, now I child, keep taking Michael's time, like uh, because I keep asking follow-up questions. How is this different than prevenient grace? Um, it's, it's not that different. This is okay. the, this is the sense that God is there, and he's he's and but see, it's prevenient grace is kind of like he's getting you all prepped so you do the right thing. And I'm I'm not really necessarily saying that. Do I believe God is at sure. work in all, all of our lives? We're orchestrating things. Yeah, I think so. You hear the story about the heathen who comes to faith and God is using all these. Yeah, sure. No problem. I believe that. And God is extending his grace again and again and again. Now, let me just follow up with the question you didn't ask just for clarity. So the infant, the infant, the cool thing about the infant is he doesn't yet have a brain to get in the way of this. So when the Holy Spirit comes and makes his claim, he's not saying willfully, now nah, I don't buy all this junk. He, he, and he just simply whatever I'm, I'm in. And so this is my experience. I'm, I was baptized a few weeks old. I didn't, I did not grow up apart from Christ and I never made my decision. I just grew up knowing who Jesus is. He's my savior. Now, did I come to moments of realization and growing in my maturity thinking, yeah, this stuff's all true. I'm going to follow Christ. Yeah. But it's not like this. That's when I made my decision. I was just, God made his claim and I just lived in that reality. And that's kind of how it goes. Okay. So uh, what would you say to somebody, like I, I could look at like Acts chapter 2 and I could say, you know, where, G, where Peter says repent and be baptized and that's his answer of like what it looks like to be saved yeah. and how to be saved. Or you, you yeah. quoted uh, the, the verse and I think it's First Peter 3, baptism now saves you. Yeah. Uh, those are some like some scriptures that like really make it seem this, this way, that there's baptismal regeneration, plus you've got loads of church history on your side. Yeah. What, do you, what do you say about like Acts chapter 10? where Peter's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls, and Cornelius and his whole ha household, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, they begin speaking yeah. in other tongues. Yeah. It, it would so seem as though that was the moment of justification yeah. slash regeneration, yeah. but, um, but he wasn't baptized until 10 minutes later or an hour later or whenever it was. They were all baptized, but right. what would you say was the exact moment, or is it just kind of like Lutherans are like, well, you know, it's somewhere in there. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, I would say it's somewhere in there. I would say, though, that the <laughs> Holy Spirit works through the, through his means, and baptism is one of those, but the word is the key, the, the active proclamation of the story of Christ, the, 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 the living word. This is what's doing it. So when that living word goes out, it actually makes the claim. And so Cornelius and his whole household are regenerate. And then Peter says, hey, they should be baptized. And everybody's like, yeah, duh, baptize these people. And so that's how this works. And the other thing we have to be careful about with the book of Acts is, the book of Acts, I'm sure you've heard this before, we have to be careful not to make it prescriptive when it's being a descriptive about kind of what's going on. And so how things unfolded there in the early church doesn't necessarily mean that way for all time. Yeah. So, um, there's two questions that come on my mind because of that explanation. Uh, one, this is describing what's happening. Um, so it's not telling us this is the normative action. Again, I'm just trying to repeat your position back to you. Right. You're saying this is not the normative action, but yeah. could and does God save outside of the means of baptism? Um, if he could and did in that instance, sure. is it possible that he could and, and does now? I know that's kind of a quick question, but... Yeah, no, no, no. The word proclaimed is absolutely sufficient, but no one's going to scorn baptism because that's clearly, you know, God has given us this gift. You're not going to scorn it, but can he be, you be saved by hearing the word apart from baptism? Yeah, of course, absolutely. 
Okay, sure. and then the, the follow-up question was at the beginning when we talked about grace, you said there are two different kinds of grace, and it sounded like you really unpacked that that gift we don't deserve, that that the Spirit is moving on our heart, and, and if and when we, we do in fact believe that's actually a work of the Spirit, not our work that we've done, but but the Spirit working within us. What was that other what was that other uh, form of grace that you had mentioned at the beginning? Yeah, the idea is the the one would be the favor day, the 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 disposition of God of just choosing me. The other one is the donum, the gift, the idea that He gives me this power, uh, and here's you get the sense of this the power to live a new life, to be a new creature, to overcome bad habits. That's that grace God gives me grace to follow Him. Yeah, okay. gotcha, 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 gotcha. All right, so. Um, one of the go-to passages and, uh, for... Just to clarify, I'm sorry, Michael. It's, just to clarify, it's not sure. two kinds of grace. It's just kind of two aspects of that one gift of God. Ah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so one of the go-to passages for the Calvinists when it comes to uh, irresistible grace is they'll talk about what they call the golden, the golden chain in Romans chapter 8. Those oh. whom God foreknew, he predestined to be uh, conformed to the image of God's Son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. And, yeah. and they'll say, hey, from beginning to end, there's no, there's no falling out here. Though he foreknew you, you're going to be glorified. I know Lutherans agree with all that, but then they'll go to the called and justified piece, and they'll say, look, every single person who's called gets justified. It, it, yeah, I guess that's the wording. So foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glorified. glorified. I think that's the order in it. Anyway, uh, but everyone who's called gets justified. And so there's no room for falling out there. So this is this is the effectual call of God. This is the grace that you cannot resist, as opposed to, uh, you know, when the apostles would go and they'd say, you know, shake the dust off their feet. You can you can resist, and there's there's grace in that, but it's it's a different kind of grace here. This is the irresistible yeah. uh, grace tied to election. Yeah, I, I guess... I, and I, I'm a systematician, so I, exegesis is not my forte. So I can always punt when I get too thick in the in exegetical okay. stuff. But I'll, I'll I'll run at this one. And sure. here's what I would say is, uh, I would I would argue that what Paul is giving us in Romans eight is the extraordinary comfort of election, which is it is. This is the whole uh-huh. point of election. How cool to know that God knew me from beforehand, and he gets his man, and he got me. And this is so cool. And this is C.S. Lewis, the hound of heaven, who just tracks me down. And mm-hmm. man, is that comforting. That is just so cool. And that's what's going on there. But then you, so, and that's that's just back to the, the divine monergism thing, bam, full blast. But then you've got to couple that with, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians 2. you got to couple that with Hebrews, you know, it's impossible for those who have seen the light and have fallen to come back. What's going on with that? So in other words, there's still this accountability. And the, the Philippians 2 passage is really potent because Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Dude, you're responsible, but it is God who is at work in you to willing to do. So which one is it? Is it human accountability or is it divine monergism? And my answer is yes. It, it is that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm, I'm curious. So we're, we're talking about um, uh, the irresistible grace uh, or, or grace in general and how that works in the life of a believer. How, how does the Lutheran Church view faith? So when I when I talk from a if I'm if I'm gonna put on like the 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 classical Armenian hat not like the modern Armenian hat but that well, classical sure. Armenian hat and I were to say uh, that faith is not a work uh, God moves upon my heart and softens my heart I hate God and, and love my sin from birth mm. He moves upon my heart uh, softening my heart in such a way that I I see the beauty and the glory of Christ mm. and I trust Him right my faith is trusting Him a Calvinist would look at me and say well if you trust God right that is actually your work you're working. But Scripture keeps calling faith and works completely separate. The book of Galatians seems to just oppose works and faith as two separate things. So the definition of faith doesn't seem to be a work. How does the Lutheran uh, uh, kind of sift out this position? Is faith a work that mm-hmm. we put in God? Is that even a work? Is is trusting, is, is believing, is acknowledging God's goodness mm-hmm. an actual work of humanity? Or is that, in fact, a, a work of the Spirit? We're gonna we we'd probably say you can see it both ways and you can argue it both ways, and that's why it's a complicated thing. But I would the, the classic definition for faith is um, an empty vessel, is the the idea of this this empty hand that simply receives. But even the ability to hold your hand out, the, the spirit has to give you this ability. You can't do this on your own. So it's that 
faith is the is the trust. Trust is Luther's key word. It's faith is trust, and that's that trust is there. But that trust has to be given to you. You don't have it. And I go back to my illustration or the scriptural image of the dead man. The dead person doesn't decide to get warmed up, and he he has to be given this gift. But once the gift is there. He's the one who does the believing. Um, in, in our dogmatics, our classic one from 100 years ago, Franz Pieper's dogmatics, he's got like six definitions of faith. And so there's faith that, you know, is actively hanging on it. And there's the faith that just kind of passively receives. And they're, they're both components of it. Faith has all these aspects are going on. So it is me doing it. The Holy Spirit doesn't do the believing. I do the believing, but I do it only by the power of the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, it is a good work. Sure, but see, even my good works are given to me by God. That's where that gift, grace is donum. Even the Christian knows that I did a good work. Not really me. It's Christ in me. And yet I'm doing it. And if I don't do the good work, who's responsible? I am. That's where the human accountability, divine monogism just runs through the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of reminded me of, I, this wasn't talking about salvation, but the apostle Paul, first Corinthians five, I worked harder than all of them yet. Not I, but the grace of God in me. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So, uh, yeah, so question, um, what's first, faith or regeneration? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say <laughs> good this is, it's the... Faith generation? <laughs> For yeah, generation. Faith, faith, is, <laughs> faith is what receives it. And so faith is what brings the new birth. I would say faith comes first. And faith is given to me by God. So the re And so, you know, it's, it's like the... <clears throat> When you, we baptize an infant, when does he become a Christian? Is the first handful of water, the second, third? It's just it's mm. the whole process. It's, it's God doing his thing. Okay. So you would say that the child... Okay, so, so that, that, that becomes difficult, because I know that's something that you said you didn't want to necessarily kind of tackle, but Fine. if, if, uh, if the, the argumentation is that children don't have faith, you would then actually say that children do have faith, Right. I would say through the gift of the Holy Spirit, they do, absolutely. And so I would say that three-week-old infant has faith because faith is not something cognitive. Faith is a trust relationship. And a three-week-old infant can have a trust relationship with its mother and has one with God as well. And it's yeah, not and I think choosing. I want to say I heard Cooper talk about this in one of his videos, uh, how he was saying like John the Baptist was in his mother's womb and right. he mm -hmm. seemed to acknowledge the Lord when he was in his presence. And I was just like... Yeah, Dang, was that's filled with the Holy argument. Spirit. Like that's that's not bad. Which is also a great argument for the sanctity of life. John it the is. Baptist being it filled is. with the Holy Spirit in the mother's womb. Yeah, so, it's good stuff, right. man. Yeah. And so you see, this this the simplicity in the Lutheran position is it's 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 divine monogism all the way down. It's grace all the way down. God chooses the infant. God chooses a thirty year old atheist and says, "You're mine." And the atheist comes to faith. Well, what's going on with that? It's it's uh, it's a regeneration. God made a dead person alive. It's a miracle, no less a miracle than an infant. And we just are mar we marvel at what God can do. It has to be a gift. It's a miraculous gift of God making alive what is dead. So and help me understand that. And the fact that I have awareness of no, I made a decision. Give me a break. You made a decision only because the Holy Spirit does it. Now you, sure, you're a human being. You think you're making these choices, but come on, this is the work of the Spirit, and we know this. No, and that's fair. So, so help me. What like what would be a synergist, right? Like you're explaining to me that faith precedes uh, regeneration. You're yeah. you're talking about how faith is is what receives this grace. So explain to me what would be a position of synergism. Uh, explain uh, that to like me. Like besides sure. Pelagianism, maybe. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, is there is there a synergistic <laughs> position that's not Pelagian? Um, the the difference we would make the distinction we would make there is kind of like. Who's doing which part? Um, and I'm trying to remember this. I haven't. I didn't prep for this time tonight. No, it's okay. <laughs> but but um, if I remember right, I want to say the right thing here. A synergist basically would say God makes the first move and then you finish it up. A classic Pelagian says you make the first moves and then God honors that and gives you more grace. Ah, and so okay. the. The classic Pelagian would say, look, this guy's really a dude. He's working really hard. And God says, okay, he deserves some grace. And then the classic synergist would say, no, I'm dead, but God makes me alive. Now I've got to do my part to kick in and start doing my, my contribution. Now the mistake in both of them, I would say, is that they're playing a zero-sum game. And they're trying to figure out what's part is God, what's part is mine. And, they're, mm -hmm. and, they're, and, they're, and if you give God anything less than 100%, you're a synergist. 
of some form, whether that's a Pelagian sin or just whatever. If you're giving God any less than 100%, that's the problem. But the biggest problem with most Protestant synergists is that they believe in free will. And if you believe in free will, I say you're basically a synergist. My next question is, <laughs> unpack that for us. <laughs> <laughs> my, my next question is, tell me more. Yeah, my next question is, don't stop there, please. Our comment section is blowing <laughs> so, up. Because yeah, like, so, uh, like, as, like as, you said, like in the West, free will is like, we get I can do whatever I, want. I can freely choose what I want on Netflix. I can freely choose yeah. any kind of fast food in the next thirty seconds delivered to my door. Free yeah. will is like part of our cultural system it's here. Freedom. How are you? Fr yeah, we freedom. watch freedom. Freedom. We watch Braveheart, man. It's all That's about pretty the freedom. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> I, I got I got a couple voices, but. Um, to explain that to us, like like uh, free will. That's that's synergistic. H yeah. Help me understand that. Yeah. Okay. Well, freedom is not free will is not even just part of our American psyche. It's part of the Enlightenment. It is core okay. to the whole Enlightenment project that we are autonomous individuals who are self willing agents who make our own way. And this is our experience. We seem we seem, we make choices. I do things, and so we we live very easily with this illusion or this delusion of free will. We think we've got it. And so then this trickles into the church and we think that, well, if you're human, you got to have free will. And that's just basic, basic definition. And how else can you account for the Garden of Eden? Adam had to have free will or it's, it's a farce. And I would say, no, no, he didn't. He was a creature. Creatures, the only, there's only one being in the, all of creation or all of the universe that has a free will, and that's God. Only God can do whatever God wants. The rest of us are contingent. I don't have a free will. I'm absolutely contingent. Now, am I accountable? Absolutely. I'm accountable for every single choice and God holds me accountable and I have the and I actually do make decisions all the time within my life for which I'm accountable and I get to make those choices. But God's God and he's he's running the show. And so this idea that, wait, I've got free will, I would say it's, it's the last vestige of a theologian of glory. He wants to count. He wants to matter for something. At least I have to say yes to God, don't I? Yes, you have to say yes. Oh, good. Then I still play. I still matter. Where the idea that, no, no, you don't even get to say yes. You're just dead. You're just a dead piece of junk. And God calls you for no reason besides he just loves you. That's grace. That's divine monergism. And frankly, it's offensive because we don't want to be that scum. We don't want to be that pathetic. We want to have some vestige of, I want to matter a little bit. At least I've got to say yes, don't I? But see, this is the whole point of Luther in the bondage of the will. You don't have a free will. You are bound. That means God has to choose you. And so a synergist would say, no, 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 no. You've got to at least make the right choice. You don't have the ability. That's why a synergist, any form of you making a choice is basically a form of synergism. Okay, so uh, Jacobus Arminius and Arminians who believe, we, we mentioned a minute ago about prevenient grace, they do believe in total depravity. They do believe that like, hey, we can't choose, but we if we have prevenient grace, then we can choose. It sounds like then, would you consider Arminians to be monergistic? Um, if that's, I have not read enough of Arminius to know as what he would be saying. And if he's talking about, you know, God making that first move, okay. But usually what's going on is this. My experience, what I have known about this is, in a sense, um, both the Calvinist position and an Arminian position are trying to solve the problem of how can you have a divine monergistic God and still have human accountability. And Calvin solves it by saying, God makes the call, we're done. And Arminius makes the, solves it by saying, no, there's a difference in people. Some people are just bigger jerks than others, and that's the difference. And the Lutheran position, which I would say is scripturally, the scriptural position would be, no, God does it all, done, and man's still responsible. And you can't reconcile them. And if you try to reconcile them, you will always end up in error. And that's what I would say is the problem with Arminius. And that seems to be kind of like a compatibilistic view, or the, the way that Calvinists would would define uh, free will in a compatibilistic worldview. So mm -hmm. there's there's Calvinism, and then there's Calvinism that's compatibilism. Um, so so for those of you who are watching, and you're like, what meaneth this? There is a bit of a, a bit of a scuffle theologically on the YouTube's right now between Leighton Flowers and Dr. Jordan Cooper, who I have both sent emails to saying. I'd host a debate if you guys want to. So <laughs> fight, uh, fight. <laughs> I will totally take advantage of you guys, you know, tossing grenades at each other. I totally will do that. Uh, but no, it's it's been a fun conversation to watch. It's been really intriguing. Uh, but 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 getting getting into those clarification points, you're you're talking about the monergistic work of God and and free will. Now, 
the bondage of the will in Luther, does it not primarily speak of the work of salvation? Uh, once God enlightens the heart, once God regenerates a, a person and they're alive, isn't their will now free and liberated from sin? Can't they choose now uh, as, a, as a freed person from Christ? Or is all freedom completely gone? No, no, no. They, they, are, they are now in Christ and free to live in Christ. They're a new creation. And so, yes, yeah. they, they have a regenerate will, which is worth Working to line up with Christ, but they're still a sinner. The whole sinner saint, semiosis epicator. Okay, so they are still sinner and saint at once, and it's just this back and forth battle. But yeah, they can make choices, but they can only do that by the power of the Holy Spirit, and they know that. And so they your, the spirit. Your, your illustration in the beginning was that Adam doesn't have a free will, but he didn't have sin. Yeah, so, yeah. So maybe I, maybe I'm just misunderstanding. No, no, I would, I would argue that people say, well, Adam had a free will. No, I would say Adam had a will that was completely in sync with God's purposes. God put at, and this is this I this I learned from Bonhoeffer in his his marvelous little book, um, Creation and Fall, which is yeah. just just this I love that text. But in Creation and Fall, what Bonhoeffer argues is that Adam didn't know good and evil before the fall. He just knew God's will, and he just did it. So is that a free will? He, his will is completely wrapped up with God's will. But for Adam, this is delight because this is what creatures are supposed to do. See, the, the, see, the illusion that has come to us is we think that if I don't have a free will, I'm, I'm subhuman. It's the opposite. When my will is in sync with God, I am the full human God intended me to be. I'm now where I belong. This is how Paul talks in Romans that, you know, that you, you're going to be a slave. Whether you're a slave of righteousness or a slave of Christ. And so when you're a slave of God and of righteousness, you're in sync with his purposes. And people say, well, you're just you're you're another man's slave. Yeah, but I'm God's slave. So that heteronomy is beauty instead of autonomy. Autonomy is inherently sinful. And this is why as Americans, especially in the West, we just get so sucked into this whole enlightenment thing. We, we can't even conceive of our humanity as being something that doesn't have free will. But that's that's the, the big lie that we've been been um, persuaded by. Okay, so so this kind of leads directly into the perseverance of the saints, because from what I understand, uh, Lutherans uh, hold firmly uh, to a position of apostasy. Apostasy is possible for the regenerate. Yeah, you can turn away and deny the faith after being regenerate in Christ. Yeah. Uh, that being said, we would have to have a free will to then choose the other, right? So if God has made us alive, mm. he's given us freedom uh, uh, to then choose Christ or not Christ. Yeah. So there are people who have who have then been made alive and are, oh, yeah. are, are firmly faith in Christ, but yep, then yep, yep. one day choose not Christ. And that's because the sinful man still hangs on with us. We are sinner and saint at, at once, the simul. And so it's, it's going on at once. And so, yeah, I'm new man. I should be walking with Christ. That's who I am. But in, in, in the insidious reality of sin, I can still jump ship. God won't change his mind about me. God, and it's the old illustration of God holds me in his hand, but I can jump out. And that's the kind of the idea here. So God won't, God will not change his mind about me, but I can walk from him. And that's where you get, you know, Philetus and Hymenaeus who have made shipwreck of their faith, you know, or whoever it is. You know, yeah. I, and, and so, and this is exactly the problem that, these are guys who are walking with Christ. Judas walking with Christ and yet falls away. And there but by the grace of God go I. That should warn all of us. And that's that warning that's real. That's why Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Be careful. You can still screw it up. God won't screw it up. That's the comfort. God will, God's got it right. But I can still make a mess of it. And I can do that. And that's not because I have a free will, but it's because I'm a human who is still depraved and still has a sinful nature hanging around me. What Luther called the old maggot sack. sack. It's still there and it can still mess me up. <laughs> okay. And, and what is that? How does that fit in with election? So uh, mm -hmm. if a person apostatizes, does that mean they were never one of the true elect? Or would that mean that they were elect and then became unelect or uh or is it just one of those kind of like mysteries that it's like you know what we're just interpreting scripture at face value and we don't have to figure that stuff out what would you say i'll go with the last one yeah <laughs> yeah well you know because Cal calvinists are you know they have their exegesis but they also love to make i mean that's where the limited atonement comes from for for them that i think it's personally i think it's hard to point to the scripture and say this definitely teaches limited atonement, right? right? Like you can, 
but you can point to a lot of scriptures that make it sound like, you know, this pretty well teaches not limited atonement. Right. My right. opinion. Okay. Right. So, but they I'm make too. the logical conclusion that, hey, if, uh, if Christ died for sins, he, sins can't pay, be paid for twice by somebody going to hell for sins that Jesus already paid for. So there's a logical deduction. And so you see that through the whole tulip. It's, hey, you know what? You're totally depraved, so you have to be unconditionally elected, and it's definitely limited atonement because you know sins aren't being paid for twice, which feeds right into irresistible grace that just flow from the beginning of time. And then, of course, you're going to persevere because God doesn't unelect his elect. And so the Calvinist says, isn't that so beautifully logical? <laughs> and it is so logical. Yeah. It really so, is logical. But it is. Um, to your point, it's it, if we go scripture by scripture, there, there can be some challenges. Well, you, Michael, you put your finger right on it. And I think this is one of the, the hallmark distinctions between a Lutheran and a Calvinist is the, the, the Calvinist, I think, puts a higher um, uh higher confidence in human logic and human ability. Whereas Luther was willing to say, I don't get it. I don't need to. I, I'll just take God at his word. What, who am I to challenge God? Who am I to, who am I to assume that God would have to be logical? Okay. So let's, let's just run through some of those, like the, the questions that are constantly asked of people who, who hold to an, a, a, a position of apostasy for those who are regenerate. Uh, questions like, is eternal life really eternal? If you've received eternal life, does it stop being eternal? Uh, if you're sealed uh, with a promise, do you get unsealed? Uh, those kinds of questions of, uh, if you were elect, did you get deselected after you were elected? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I don't know how that, I don't know the technicals on those. What I would say is this, God has made his choice and he won't unmake it. This is why when we have an infant who gets baptized, it's a real baptism. God made his choice. If that, if that individual grows up and walks away from the faith and then decides, you know, through the work of the Spirit, I, what am I doing? I need to get back. We don't rebaptize. God made his call. He made his choice. God, God has said, this is it. And he's not going to change his mind about you. And, that, and back to Luther's illustration of the castle. The castle's still yours. You choose to move out, your, your loss. And so in a sense, if the person rejects by walking away from what God has given, God doesn't rescind his offer. It's still there and it's still there. Here, here you have it. Simply come and receive. And then the person who says, oh, I have to go find God again. He's, he's there. God never left. The, the person has walked away from the, from the benefit of that. And so, and these things get, get hard because it starts to sound like, you know, you, I'll, I'll broach this subject too. It starts to make it starts to make universalism look really attractive because God will get what He wants in spite of us, and you know, and that's that's just the power of God's grace. And I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis, who you know everybody knows he got he got kind of funny there with his um, line the witch in the wardrobe of that the last battle. You know, things got a little sketch there. But you've got the dwarves <laughs> who are there in the new Narnia, but they don't want to be part of it. They're sitting in this little circle saying this isn't true. It's not true. They're there, but they're not even participating because of their own willful rejection of the gifts given. And so that's kind of that's kind of getting at this. And I'm not espousing universalism, but I am espousing the idea that God is making the offer. The election, here it is, man. I've saved you. Here's the gift. You saying yeah. yes or no? Are you going to say yes by the power of the Spirit? Or are you going to be the idiot to walk away from this and forfeit the very gift you've got? And that's that's the that's the the scandal, the the tragedy of human sinfulness. Yeah. And how would a Lutheran define apostasy? Is apostasy, I don't believe in Christ anymore? Or does it mean that, like, you know, could apostasy be something less, like you die in your sin? Like maybe you're, you're in rebellion against God. You haven't, den you know, like renounced your faith in Christ, but maybe it's You had drugs a bad Thursday. And, yeah. You know, you watched uh, well, an but if, What if it's movie? even worse than that? What if it's like um, you're, you're definitely living a carnal life, but you're still calling yourself a Christian. Is that apostasy? Can you apostatize with just your deeds? Or is it like, oh, no, I'm openly renouncing Christ? How yeah. much pasta is necessary to apostatize? <laughs> it's the question. Um, apostasy classically would be, of course, a renunciation of Christ. And that's, okay. that's the straight up thing. Okay, so I, I, I'm walking away from this. and I, I renounce this. That's, that's classic apostasy. Now, can you apostatize with your actions? I would say yes. Now you might find some Lutherans who will, who will quibble with this, and I and I've got concerns about some of them. I I would call them less faithful than they should be. Who would say, okay. "Hey, baptism, 
Baptisms, you're in like Flynn, man. You're cool. Don't worry about Half it. Lutherans. And so, you know, what's that? Lutheran, Lutheran light. Is that what you're calling them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> baby, <laughs> many Beer, Lu- baby Lutherans. <laughs> Beerman's calling them Lutheran light. Do you do you get a lot of references? Beerman, like they're like that's a. I got the very first comment I got in this live chat was that's a Lutheran name, Beerman. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it oh, is. I'll, I'll own that. I have no problem with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've gotten used to it. But um, so, so can you apostatize with your actions? I think yeah, absolutely. In other words, and this this is where I would say, and this makes me maybe a little bit unusual from some of my Lutheran brothers who would say, oh no no no, God's grace does it all, it covers everything, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. No, it matters. The person who's not living like he's in Christ is not in Christ. And this is why you get First Corinthians five, where Paul, you know, excommunicate the brother. He's married his stepmother, his stepmother for crying out loud. He's not part of you, and so your actions can put you outside the faith. Absolutely. Okay. Um, hey, I want to ask a question. This is from one of our viewers. His name's Barely Protestant, it, but he asked it a couple of times, and I, I kind of hesitated to ask it because I actually don't think I could articulate what this is very well. So if this is not your area, that's okay. But here's a question. Um, he really he just asks. Um, well, actually, I lost his question, so I'm just going to tell you: um, Is Lutheranism compatible in some way with Molinism, or how would you compare or contrast Lutheranism with Molinism? Um, I'm not a big Mol- Molina guy, but what I know enough to say that I think no, it's not the, on the same track because Molina is really trying to make it all work. And we're not interested in trying to make it all work. It's a little bit like why we reject transubstantiation. Maybe, but who needs? We don't need to define it. We're not interested. We're not in the business of trying to explain what doesn't need to be explained. And so the idea that God's complete divine monergism and man's complete human accountability—they're both 100% responsible. We just leave it. And I, I think the problem with Molinism, with all of his different categories, this and that, you know, the middle kind of thing, it, he's, he's he's trying to explain what doesn't need to be explained, and we would say can't be explained. So like a lot of these denominations that we've been interviewing recently, like we've, we, you know, I was raised like Pentecostal charismatic, right? And then we, we started the show, we interviewed lots of Baptists and we started interviewing Presbyterians and we kind of came to that mainline Methodist kind of group, you know, but then we've like reached out and we've, we started doing these, uh, 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 Anglican denominations, cool. Lutheran denominations, we've been doing Eastern Orthodox groups. So like, cool. h- how do we, it, it seems as if my mainline denominations here in the States um, have a very rigid system of thinking. Again, logic, w- w- really a high view and esteem for logic. But all of these other denominations seem to have such great adoration for mystery. Yeah. Um, we've only got a few minutes left, and I know this isn't really a soteriological question, but but how, how would you encourage these mainline denominations, Christian brothers, to say, hey, really embrace mystery not as weakness, but as strength. We're trusting God with something we don't understand. Well, you, you said it very well. Um, I, I think one of the dangers we have in a lot of our Protestant history is, is uh, we, we, we're basically rational. Rationalists. And rationalism is another one of these fruits of the Enlightenment, which is just not there with the pre-Enlightenment guys. Even Calvin, you know, he, he starts, he's heading in that direction, but man, it was Bates who went over the top on it. And it's the same with Lutheranism. Luther was, he was not a rationalist at all. But some of his, the guys in the two or three generations later, you know, the higher Lutheran Orthodox guys, yeah, they fell into that same trap. So it's there for all of us. And the Enlightenment makes it, the Enlightenment makes it really attractive. And so rationalism, I would argue, is anti-faith. And yes, our intellect is involved. Yes, we love God with our minds. But man, we, we, the idea that we can figure him out or the idea that somehow God is, is um, subject to our rational ideas or our logic, it's just an affront to who God is. And so you're right. There, there needs to be this mystery of God is God. And I'm not. And who am I to think I've got this figured out? Howard Wass has this um, wonderful quote that I love. He said that the very subject of theology should make us always wonder whether theologians ever know what they're talking about. And I think he's on the right track there. You know, we're talking about God here. Who, who can claim to have our mind around that and that figured out? Yeah, and the Eastern Orthodox have a similar, well, not a similar position, but I mean, they, they would say that you can't define God by things, but you can define him by things he is not. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, like they go through those things and say, hey, he's he's not that. Right. I, again, I, w- I just want to I want to give just on what you said, because again, I think that there's a lot of truth in embracing humility, but I also want to like push back at the same token and say like, mm-hmm. 
those ecumenical creeds at the beginning were trying to figure God out, right? <laughs> Not Arianism, but like, oh, but what, what if Arius just showed up and was like, but there's mystery, you know? Yeah. And I, I know that you don't you don't hold this, right? But what if what if uh, the, the the modalists were like, but there's mystery, but like shouldn't shouldn't <laughs> no, we no, no, no. embrace I, mystery but still push for like a, a logical answer simultaneously? We are what I would say the creeds were doing is not trying to figure God out is they're trying to articulate what had been revealed to them. In other right. words, they watched Jesus do stuff and they, they heard from Jesus. And then they now he, now that they have the spirit active in them, they're trying to sort this out and trying to articulate it. They're not making up theology. They're not writing new doctrine. They're just simply articulating what they have encountered, what they have seen, what they, what they saw in Jesus. That's what they're doing. Yeah, and I would agree with that. But like, again, my, my point would be they are going through great painstaking details oh, to articulate as and clearly as possible. Should, should we also in the same way when we look at the sacraments take painstaking details and to not, though to be humbled by the fact we will not know everything, still Correct. push and try to understand mystery? Of course. Of okay. course, it's, it's, we're thinking God's thoughts after him. And this is how we, one of the ways we worship God. We worship God with our minds. I believe this. Um, we make a distinction between a magisterial use of reason or a ministerial use of reason. And so we use scripture in a servant mode as a minister, not as our Lord and master or teacher in a magisterial mode. And so that's we use reason, but always in a servant mode. That's good. Yeah. OK, well, um, uh, what we like to do now, and we often do this, Dr. Bierman, is we like to kind of wrap it up with just a few closing thoughts. And so maybe just give you a minute to think about just if there was one thing that you'd want to say to leave our viewers with, to summarize what we've been talking about, just one thing that they can take away. Maybe think about what that would be. And then, Josh, I'll volley it over to you. What would you say is just kind of like your closing thought, the thing that you would want to to leave everybody with? Um, you should agree with Dr. Bierman on total depravity. <laughs> and apostasy and the resistibleness of grace but then everything else i'm not quite sure <laughs> no, no, <laughs> what about sir, infant, sir, infant baptism infant, yeah this is the thing man uh i want you to come back on my, my closing thought is come back on and let's talk about infant baptism and and we'll, we'll, maybe, maybe, we'll, we'll maybe we'll have you and jordan cooper on at the same time that'd be that'd be a blast but uh i i'm i'm interested in this i'm fascinated by this i don't like that i'm on the other side of church history on this one i i'm, I'm i'll be honest like well, particularly I, with just uh, with baptismal regeneration. Yeah, I'm on the other side of church history with baptismal regeneration. I don't like that. Yes. Like, I wish all of church history agreed with me and said that baptism is uh, believer's baptism that happens after saving faith, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so I'd love to get some of your closing thoughts. Or, so, so I'd love to get you to come back on the show and discuss that. But I'll go ahead and toss it over to you for closing thoughts. As, as I, yeah. I don't really have closing thoughts on soteriological systems I don't necessarily hold. So <laughs> I'm going to toss it your way, man. <laughs> That's fair. I, my biggest point would be it's it's not something we're going to solve. The, sure. the divine monogism, God makes the choice, and we just delight in that. See, election is to be a comfort, and it and it is. That's when good. you think about God making the choice of me, why? I'm just I'm just this idiot, and yet He called me. How cool is that? And I, I get to be His son for eternity. How cool is that? Now I'm still a human being, and I have the ability to do stupid things and to make a mess of things. I need to live a circumspect cautious life. I can't, I'm not just, I can't just waltz around doing what I feel like. I can't presume upon this grace. And that's where the, the, the caution comes in. And yet it's not a scared, running scared caution, you know, like, oh, am I going to fall? No, I'm not. God's got me. It's cool. And so there's this weird sort of a thing where you're like careful and circumspect and, and serious, but at the same time, just kind of carefree and light. And it can be both at once. That's, that is exactly how Lutheranism functions. That's good. And I would like to reserve the right to change my closing statement. Monergism is biblical. You should believe it. That's my, that's my closing <laughs> that's good. Okay. okay. Uh, Cause I, I do. I'm a, I'm a monergist fan. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Oh, my closing thoughts. Well, I was just going to volley it over to you, but you know what? Hey, it's all grace. Everything's grace. There you go. And we're thankful for uh, this salvation. That's all from Jesus. Cool. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Beerman, stay on the line if you would. We're going to wrap this episode up. If you guys uh, enjoyed this episode of Remnant Radio, make sure to hit the like button and share it out to your friends who are like, what the heck is Lutheranism? Go ahead and send this to them. <laughs> subscribe. Might, might be, you got to subscribe if you haven't subscribed. There, there is uh, still to this day, our, our numbers have gone down. The pandemic has gone down. 
Uh, but like, the, the pandemic that you guys don't know about is unsubscribe tonight. Uh, I think it's, it was one in 10 people who watch remnant radio suffer for un unsubscribe tonight. the only way to fix it is by subscribing to the channel as your earliest <laughs> convenience. So, uh, you guys do that, like the video. If you liked it, dislike it, hit the dislike button twice and we'll see you tomorrow for Eric Metaxas. Talking, 215. going deep wow. on Luther, man. Yeah. We're gonna be talking. Eric. Yeah. But it's, it's gonna be a 30 minute interview. Well, we're talking about the history. Not so much the theology, but the history of Martin Luther. My, my goal is to is to get him to go an hour, but oh, man. he says thirty. Like, we've already said it online. You can't be saying <laughs> that. Like his, okay. his publicist is going to watch this and be like, "I'm joking." Thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Thirty minutes sharp. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're unmerited favor. We'll see you guys next time on Remnant Radio. Be blessed. <laughs>